I am limped. Thank you. Thank you to this beautiful land. Thank you to the Sinai people and all indigenous people. Thank you to my Swedish ancestors, all my teachers. Without all of you, I could not do this talk tonight. And thanks so much to all of you for coming out for this cheerful topic of climate change. You know, think globally, act locally, and panic internally. Uh, mental health and health issues are increasingly being affected by climate change. And I will argue tonight that mental health and trauma, collective trauma, might be one contributing factor to the behaviors that lead to climate change. Many of my teachers, including Joanna Macy, says to always start with gratitude. So I invite you to think about, what are you grateful for today? This is my dog, beautiful Nelson. How does it feel like when you consider what you're grateful for? And we need those kind of things to regulate your nervous system, to resource yourself before we actually consider all these things I've been talking about tonight. Another way to resource yourself, to find a capacity to be calm, um, creative, is through our senses, to use our whole body intelligence instead of just our head. So, uh, if you like to, you may join me in some movements. So, uh, my first thing, uh, I'd like you to invite you to start shaking your hands. Maybe you want to shake your shoulders, maybe your whole self. I let go, I release. And then, maybe you want to do the victory pose, famous from a TED talk. I feel grateful, I feel empowered. And then you may want to put a hand on your heart and one on your tummy. <sighs> I feel safe, I feel loved. And just notice how those little movements felt in your body and how at any time tonight or when you feel stressed, you can come back to movements like that. Um, so how did I get into this with mental health and climate change? This is me and Nelson too on a very uh, smoky day, so you can't see Elephant Mountain over there. Um, well, let me take you back to the year 2000. Uh, you may know of Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, uh, and before her, decades before her, there were also youth climate activists, and one, I was one of them. And with others, we took a bus to the Netherlands for COP6, uh, the convention of the parties of the UN Climate Convention. Together with other activists, we built this wall of sandbags outside the meeting uh, building as a reminder of the rising sea levels. Inside, I got to meet with the Swedish environmental minister. We actually made a bet with him that the youth could sa save more greenhouse gases. But in the end, I actually felt pretty disheartened. It felt like the, uh, the decision makers were listening more to the fossil fuel industry instead of the youth and the people affected by climate change. And actually, since that first COP6 meeting, the greenhouse gases uh, have actually increased by 60%. So I actually felt pretty sad, pretty angry. <sighs> but I realized I wasn't the only one. Uh, for example, in the sixth IPCC report, they quote a lot of research who says that uh, uh, climate change is affecting our mental health. There is anxiety about the future, especially if you're a young person. It's kind of a pre-PTSD. Uh, and if you are 
happen to be in an in a extreme weather effect. You might have PTSD and depression and sleep disorders. The list goes on. Actually, there's proven every, that there's more suicidal behaviors, more domestic violence with increasing heat. And this is affecting marginalized populations more. It's also affecting uh, climate researchers, uh, climate activists, and the first responders. Maybe there are some firefighters out here who are doing things in what we used to call summers, but now it's the smoke and fire season. In the ecological grief workshops that I offer, we also learn that it's okay to feel all those feelings. Uh, to create a safe environment when we can feel sad and angry. Uh, it's actually a healthy reaction to an unhealthy world. And I, I want to ask you two, um, what kind of trauma response do you have to climate change? In a simplified way, is it flight, fight, or freeze? And you may join me in these movements too. Do you feel for, you can stomp your feet, do you feel for running away, ignoring climate change? keeping busy with other things? Or do you feel like fighting? You can press your hands together. Oh, do you feel angry, distrusting, blaming? There's always someone who's, who's not doing enough. Or do you feel all frozen, numb? I think we can all feel different at different times. And then, you know, to ground yourself, maybe put your hand in the heart again. Ah, it's okay. Um, so, let me tell you another story as well. So, just uh, before I went to the COP6, I had been in India, in Odisha on the East Coast for, for my studies, and a cyclone hit. And 10,000 people died, maybe 30,000 people. It's like more than living here in Kalsagar and Nelson and this area where the college is. And if we would really mourn all these people, we could do that for the rest of our lives. And things like that are happening all the time. And I, I had studied climate change and inequalities and poverty and, and now I had, I had like the embodied experience. Like I had never seen a corpse before no matter a corpse that was really rotten, or like a child. It's like so horrible. And I saw that all these things are connected. We can't just talk about climate change without considering gender relationship, or indigenous people, or equality. And and a way to understand all these is, um, is through this iceberg symbol uh, from systems change, um, systems thinking. Just like an iceberg has an invisible top and then a bigger hidden side to it, uh, the social, ecological, mental health crisis, they are the visible symptoms. But we can't just address the symptoms. We have to go deeper, look at the institutions, the structures, and what's driving below that is the worldviews, the beliefs, the values, assumption that we make about the world. And I would argue, and some with me, that trauma is maybe driving those worldviews. Just on another note, one of my students said that I can't use this uh, metaphor for too much longer because the icebergs are gonna melt anyway. And here's a, another youth climate activist from Mexico and New York City, Zia Bastida. The climate crisis is a consequence of a mindset. Other example of this domini domination, colonial mindset is uh, emphasis on individuals, that land can be owned and sold, humans are more important than nature, the denial of the limits of our planet, or this doctrine of discovery uh, that the Pope uh, declared very long time ago, but it's still referred to in law in North America, invade, capture, and subdue all pagans and reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. So 
I was asking myself, this is so horrible. Where does this come from? Are we born like that? And that's where I came to look more into trauma. So trauma is uh, what happens in our minds and in our bodies when we're uh, in, in a situation that we perceive as a threat. Uh, but so it's really what's happened inside to us when there's not a loving witness, when we're not able to complete that uh, flight, fight, or freeze response in, in a simplified way. Uh, some, you can also say it's like too much too fast or in developmental trauma for children, it's too little for too long. It's like an overwhelm. And there's an intelligence in our reaction, but we can get stuck in this, and it kind of limits how we look at the world. Uh, and our early childhood experience really sets the baseline for how our nervous systems will operate, how our worldview is created. So um, actually, adverse childhood experiences like living with violence, neglect, abuse, are really common. 64% of US citizens uh, say that they experienced one adverse childhood experience, but many have experienced many of those. And there's lots of research, really grateful for um, psychology professor Darshan Nar Narvis, and all her research how uh, how we research children really matters. And actually, she's showing that 90 to 95% of human history, we actually lived like indigenous people and we raised our children in a very nurturing and caring way. But through time, maybe through uh, war and, and different conflicts and, and, and stress, we are raising our kids in a more traumatizing way. And that has effects for our health uh, through our lives. <laughs> and so she's showing that how we raise our kids actually impact our moral development, our mental health, and our worldview. <laughs> but trauma can also be collective, like for our indigenous peoples in residential school, like Holocaust, like what's happening in the Middle East right now. Um, or for, for here too, as we as a group experience wildfires and, and smoke. And, and the consequences can, can live on. Uh, yeah, you can also call this collective trauma and historical trauma like a systemic violence that uh, is ongoing and that we have to address. Okay, kind of depressing stuff. But there are lots of people who also are uh, finding ways how we can relate to this. And my way to remember some of those other people's ideas, I call it warm health. And that is both addressing the world use and instead, instead having a kinship world view that is very much like the indigenous uh, world view that we see that we are relational, that we're connected, um, that we can be generous. Uh, uh, warm health is about connection to nature to nurture, to our nervous systems, and to knowledge systems. So uh, I'm a nature educator, and I see every day with the children how awesome it is to be outside. And there are countless research reports to prove that, whether you're a kid or an adult. It's good for mental health. Uh, and both for senses and mindfulness and the awe and gratitude of, of being in the natural world. But also, I would really encourage you to know your naturalist skills. How many of you here know 10 local birds? 20 birds? 10 trees? 20 trees? 10 tracks? Animal tracks? The more you know about the place, this is a basic in environmental education, you have to know 
nature to love it and take care of it. Connection to nurture. Uh, this is what Darshan Narvars talks about and positive childhood experiences. It's about social health, relational health. For example, uh, an organization I've trained with Seek Healing in Asheville, North Carolina. They were recently hit by the Hurricane Helene. But their group meetings of connection practice uh, helped w people digest that experience. Connection to a nervous system is somewhat we've been trying here today to be aware of a trauma response, to be able to regulate ourselves, to be able to release anger and grief when we need to in a safe place. And we work a lot about that in schools. Connection to the knowledge systems, the awareness about how our world use, my privileges, my white fragility, how that impacts how I see the world. Um, so yeah, being aware of trauma, being aware of your world views. Um, and I know it's really complex with the polar crisis. There's no easy solutions. Uh, this is from... Uh, uh, eco-grief event I was part of. So I just want to breathe in the risk of collapse and breathe out gratitude. And just that we can feel that connection. So as a closing, uh, I invite you to put your hands together, rub your hands, think about what will you will take with you from this night. What will you absorb? What makes sense to you? Put your thumbs to the left, <laughs> so your, your right hand is on top, and then be aware that there are other people here. And slowly, if you can move your hands out, and you don't have to touch your neighbor, but just put one hand above and one below. And maybe if you're on a, on a corner, you can imagine that you're connecting to a tree, the atmosphere, uh, a loved one, and just feel that we're connected, we're part of warm health. Thank you. <laughs>